Are you coming? You never know. I doubt. Are you coming? Doesn't look like it. Is it happening this year? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't know. I feel so uncertain. Hare Krishna, everyone, and welcome to Toronto's 48th annual Festival of India. Today is our last of 12 days. It's certainly been a unique and exceptional year. Um, we've had 12 days filled with cooking classes, yoga classes, meditation classes, an amazing 12-hour kirtan, incredible philosophical classes. And yesterday, hopefully, you got to take part in our virtual parade, the first of its kind, where Lord Jagannath and his siblings went cruising down Young Street in his convertible. It was truly very special. And then, of course, we had drive-by darshans throughout the, D the GTA. Um, Lord Jagannath brought us together in a very different but very special way. Um, we've had a number of seminars throughout the festival and an incredible lineup of speakers, including His Holiness Chandramali Swami, His Holiness Bhakti Mark Swami, His Holiness Sachinandan Swami, Hari Prashad Prabhu, uh, Her Grace Krishna Nandini Prabhu, just an incredible lineup. Um, it's also been a very unique and special year for another reason. Just last weekend on the 4th of July, we lost a very important and special leader in the ISKCON community named His Holiness Bhakti Charu Swami. He passed away from complications due to COVID-19. And so we'd like to dedicate our entire festival as well as today, our last day to him. Um, and as I mentioned, we've, uh, it's been a big loss to the community, but we can feel his presence and his blessings upon us um, throughout the last 12 days. So as mentioned, we've had an amazing lineup and today is no exception. We're so honored and excited today to have with us Her Grace Rukmini Prabhu. Welcome. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Good so Rukmini, thank you so much for being here. Um, so Rukmini Prabhu is a disciple of Srila Prabhupada. She has been a follower in the Bhakti movement since the 1960s. She's involved in so many services, including interfaith out outreach. She is a mentor to so many. She is the founder of Urban Devi, which is a collective of women who come together for Sangha or association regularly. She's very beloved in the ISKCON community. And I just want to say also to myself personally and to my husband, Hari Prasad, we love her. We love you very much. Um, so thank you again for being here. So today, Rukmini Prabhu is going to speak to us about journeying beyond the festival. So every year, but somehow this year in particular, there's always some sadness at the end of the festival. And so today, Rukmini Prabhu is going to speak to us about how to keep Lord Jagna and the festive spirit in our hearts beyond today. And so without further ado, I present to you Rukmini Prabhu. Thank you so much. I'll say some prayers to begin. Prayers of invocation. Om Akyana Timarandasya Kyananjana Salakaya Jaksun Militam Hinatas Mai Shi Kurovi Namaha Shi Chetana Mano Vistam Sapitam Yena Bhutale Sayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati sa pasandikam. Nama Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale. 
Shrimate Bhakti Vedanta Swamini Tinamane Namaste Saraswate Deve Gauravani Pracharine Vishesha Sunyavari Paschatya Dishatarine Mukam Karoti Vachalam Pangolam Gayate Giving Yes, Kripas Tamahang Bande Shigurun Dinatarinam Panchaka Pataru Vyascha Kripas Indu Vaivacha Patitanam Pavane Bio Vaishnavi Bio Namo Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitana Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shiva Sadi Gora Bhakta Vindam Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya, Jaya Nityananda, Jaya Tvaita Chandra, Jaya Gora Bhaktarinda, Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya, Jaya Nityananda, Jaya Dvaita Chandra, Jaya Gora Bhaktavinda. Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya, Jaya Nityananda, Jaya Dvaita Chandra, Jaya Gora Bhaktavinda. Chakinata Swami, Nayana Patakami, Bhava Tume. Thank you so much for inviting me to this probably first ever in the history of Lord Jagannath virtual Rathiyatra, 48th annual, but first time virtual Rathiyatra. And um, so kind of you to invite me. And I've been asked to speak about journeying beyond the festival. So if we think of a journey, we think of going out from where we are. Um, but a pilgrimage is a type of a journey where we try to travel inward. We um, leave the comforts of home where everything is known and familiar and travel in unknown circumstances and um, find out, try to find out more, try to discover more about, about our unknown inner self. So I was thinking that in, in olden times, people, of course, in Europe, in India, in um, Asia, people would walk for, for how many hours, for many days, um, for, for realizations, for, for healing, and all the while meditating on their intention and the internal goal of the pilgrimage. And then gradually, gradually, they would arrive after a long, long time with their body and their mind together with great intention at some holy place. But in recent times, we fly by airplane, we get there in 15 hours or 20 hours, and sometimes our body ar arrives before our mind. Our mind might still in be in Toronto or New York or Chicago. Um, and even more recently, we just arrived instantly by, by click, by Zoom call and and um sometimes we wonder have, have i really arrived with my whole my body but also my mind and my heart to be able to hear to meditate to go more deeply and to go further along on my journey so yeah pilgrimage is this type of an internal journey of the soul a journey inward not outward and on pilgrimage there's so many temporary inconveniences that that have to be tolerated. Sometimes we're staying at some kind of a Spartan dharmshala where, you know, could be anything lacking the comforts of home. Um, but keeping, trying to keep the goal of the pilgrimage foremost in our mind and heart. And this is the real mood of pilgrimage. The poet Rumi says that this world is like a guest house. He says, this being human is like a guest house. Every morning is a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. 
Welcome them, he says, and entertain them all. Treat each guest honorably. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. So if we think about this, if you think of this idea of pilgrimage, there will be so many challenges. And, and each one is sent to teach us um, how to go deeper into who we really are. So if we want to journey beyond the festival, we have to try to focus our vision and our intention beyond today and beyond this world even. We're meant for a higher purpose. We're meant for a higher life beyond this tiny ego, egoistic life of tiny world of I and mine, tiny world of my mind and my senses and my family and my possessions. A world of loving Krishna, loving his world, his merciful devotees, his most auspicious holy name, his beautiful form and qualities and pastime. So when we think of Rathayatra, we have to think of Lord Chaitanya and his followers. And they used to come, they used to walk from Navadweep or their different villages, wherever they were, every year. Lord Chaitanya asked them to come every year to Jagannath Puri for the Kart Festival. And they would walk many miles, many days, and but still they they had this ecstatic intention of of seeing Lord Goranga when they would arrive seeing him once again after a long time. And they would stay in Puri for Rathayatra for some weeks or some months, and then they would walk all the way back. And then they would do that again next year. They would do that every year. So with great intention. What What is the mood of this Rathayatra? Rathayatra is a festival of pulling the Lord back to Vrindavan by the ropes of our love. At Rathayatra, the Lord becomes all the more Petita Pavana. Lord Jagannath is called Petita Pavana. And if you go, there's the Petita Pavana Jagannath who's facing out um, all year round. But at Rathayatra time, he comes out and he gives his darshan to anyone and everyone, everyone who's not usually given access inside. And he stops his cart at his own will whenever and wherever he chooses. Maybe you know the story of how Jagannath stopped his cart in front of the house of Bhaktivinoda Thakur when he was the chief magistrate. So he had a house on Grand Road at that time. Now that house on Grand Road is the Gaudiamak temple. It's the birthplace of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, his son. So Jagannath's cart spontaneously stopped there in front of their house by Jagannath's sweet will. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur's uh, saintly wife, she took the opportunity, and because she was the magistrate's, magistrate's wife, she, she could come up onto the cart and she brought her newborn baby um, up onto the cart. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur had prayed to Bhimala Devi, who is Subhadra, to send him uh, a child who would assist him in his work. And when his wife put the new, newborn baby at the feet of Lord Jagannath. Jagannath's garland fell on, on around him. And so they took that as a sign that this was the child who had been graced to come and assist with the mission of, of Bhaktivinoda Thakur of Lord Chaitanya. So they named him Bhimala Prashad, um, the future Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. And there's another story of when he stopped it, his car. Of course, there are many, but there's a famous devotee. I don't know if you've heard of him, but a Muslim devotee of Lord Jagannath, um, whose name was Salabeg. And his father was some kind of a Mughal chieftain, a warrior. And it said that he, that chieftain forcibly married Salabeg's mother, who was a, a young Brahmin widow. And as soon as he was old enough, Salabeg took up fighting in his father's campaigns. But once he was severely wounded in battle and battling for his life, he accepted the advice of his mother and chanted the holy name of Lord Krishna and he was miraculously cured. 
So he was feeling greatly indebted to Krishna and he tried to find out more about him. And from his mother, he came to know that Lord Jagannath is the incarnation of Lord Krishna. So amazed and thrilled, he went to Puri, but he was refused entrance into the temple of Jagannath due to his Muslim birth. But after that, he went to Vrindavan and he lived the life of an ascetic in the association of sadhus, reciting bhajans in honor of Lord Sri Krishna. And after about a year in Raja, he returned to Puri desiring to, he wanted to see the Rathi, Rath Kart Festival of Lord Jagannath, but on the way he suddenly fell ill. So he was feeling helpless and realized that he would not reach Puri in time to see the Ratha Yatra festival. And he offered prayers to Lord Jagannath, petitioning him to please wait until he would arrive. So on the day of the return cart festival, Jagannath goes on his festival to the Gundicha Mandir. And then 12 days later, he comes back. So on the day of this return Rath festival, the cart stopped and did not move until this Muslim devotee, Salabeg, arrived there. So that place where, where the cart stopped, stopped and remained stationary to give darshan to, to this um, very devout Muslim devotee, Salabeg, it was later used by Salab Salabeg for composing many bhajans in honor of Lord Jagannath. And his body was later cremated there after his death. So the samadhi of this great devotee is still standing there on the Grand Road in Puri near Balagandi in, in honor of him every year the car, of the cart festival. The cart of Lord Jagannath stays there for a while near his samadhi and stops in honor of him. So Jagannath, um, by his own free will, he, he's pulled by the love of the devotees and he stops his cart uh, at his will. Um, to honor his beloved devotees. So how to carry forward this, this mood of the Rathiatra festival after it ends? How, did, how do we journey beyond the festival? So again, as I said, at the Rathiatra festival, Lord Jagannath comes out of his temple and becomes all the more Petita Pavana, all the more merciful to the most fallen people, ourselves, right? He gives his darshan to everyone, and all of those who are, are, are given access who are usually not allowed darshan inside the temple. All year long, Jagannath um, lives in an opulent palace. He gets 52 offerings a day. He likes to eat his offerings so much. He's surrounded by pomp and circumstance and opulent rituals of worship. And hundreds of priests worship him every day like a king, elaborate worship and Vedic mantras. And yet he longs for the simple mood of Vrindavan. He misses the simple village of cows, cowherd boys, gopis or cowherd girls, where the flute is his favorite companion and where Krishna is decorated with garlands of forest flowers and colored minerals from the Govardhan hill. Vrindavan is a place where everyone is inclined to love Krishna and Krishna is inclined to love them. So if we want to carry this mood forward to journey beyond the festival, we have to also, like Lord Jagannath, journey beyond sectarianism, beyond casteism, classism, racism, sexism, and speciesism even. When Srila Prabhupada came to Puri, he spoke very strongly. He said, he is called, the Lord here is called Jagannath, Lord of the universe. He is not called Purinath. He is not only the Lord of this one tiny city. So he was beseeching them really to allow the Western people to come in and have the darshan of Lord Jagannath. So this mood of Srila Prabhupada, this mood of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, is exemplified in a, a, a beautiful verse that Srila Prabhupada would often quote in lectures and sometimes in letters also. Let me speak this verse to you. It's Srimad Bhagavatam, 2nd Canto, 4th Chapter, 18th verse. Sukadev Goswami names uh, many of the races of the people of the world. He says, 
Kiratahu nandra pulinda pulkasa abhirashumbha yavana kusadaya yen ye chapapa yadapashraya shraya sudanti tasmaye prabha vishnave namaha so he mentions the, the Greeks by name, the Greeks, the Turks, the Mongolians, the Huns, Germans and Russians, and even the people of Andhra are mentioned and all others, it said, who are addicted to sinful activities, all can be purified by taking shelter of the devotees of the Lord because the Lord is Prabhavishna, Prabhavishna, the all-powerful Lord. So if we want to journey beyond the festival, we need to carry this mood of Patita Pavana, Lord Jagannath, out into the world and honor all people as his beloved sacred parts and parcels and give compassion, show kind appreciation, show encouragement. Jesus Christ said, as you do unto the least of these, the lowest of all people, you do unto me. And Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said something similar in Chaitanya Bhagavad, where he says that every one of the innumerable living beings is, Lord Chaitanya says, my beloved part and parcel. He's speaking as the Supreme Lord. And he says, if anyone causes harm to any one of them, I will cause harm and make that person suffer even more. So if we want to make our hearts like Vrindavan, simple, sweet, Madhurya means sweet, sincere, and without any ulterior motive, without any hypocrisy. Um, this is the mood of Vrindavan. This is the mood that attracts the heart, that pulls the heart of Lord Jagannath. So as Radha Bhakti mentioned at the beginning, this past week, we've been mourning the passing of a very beloved servant of Srila Prabhupada, Bhakti, His Holiness Bhakti Charu Swami. So he captured the heart of Srila Prabhupada so completely. How did he do that? He captured the hearts of really everyone who knew him, everyone he met. He was so kind, so gentle so appreciative of even a small gesture with no hypocrisy. When you would meet him, he would say, oh, I'm so glad to see you. And then he would say that to another person as well. His heart was so melded to the mission of Srila Prabhupada. He had no separate life, no separate motive. So a devotee like that pulls the Lord, captures the Lord by the ropes of his love. And the Lord becomes a prisoner of the love of such a devotee, devotee like that. And um, so we have to try to also become simple, sincere, and without false motives in our Krishna consciousness, in our lives. And if we carry this move, move forward beyond the festival, then the whole world, I think the whole world will become inquisitive. What is this kind of love? What is this sweetness? C could I also learn to love like this person? Could I learn to appreciate all others like this person? It's said that gratitude or appreciation is a type of a soil, like a type of a dirt in which pride does not very easily grow. Think about that. If, if we think, I wish I could give up my false pride, we might consider gratitude, try appreciating others every day. Appreciation is an antidote to gratitude, the soil in which pride does not easily grow. In the material world, this world of I and mine, we arrive here empty handed, we leave empty handed, but in between, we're trying to build our illusory empires of home and family and possessions. And I think to journey beyond. The festival is a journey of realization that only Krishna is mine and I am his. To learn to love him and serve him as the high, highest goal of our life's achievements. All other goals and all other ch achievements will fade in time, actually, other than that one goal.
when I was a young devotee, I was initiated by Srila Prabhupada in Montreal. And Srila Prabhupada was speaking from the prayers of Prahlad Maharaj. And in his prayers to Lord Nishingadev, Prahlad Maharaj was addressing the Lord as my Lord. And one devotee asked at the end of the Srila Prabhupada's talk, how can, if we're trying to give up the idea of I and mine, how can a devotee say my Lord? How can we say my anything? And Srila Prabhupada answered in such a profound way. He said, Krishna is mine and he is yours. He is everyone's. That's all. It was like a great Mahavakya of Srila Prabhupada, something like Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But yeah, Krishna is mine. He's yours. He's everyone's. That's all. Beyond this tiny life, this tiny world of body, mind, and egoistic pursuits, we're meant for this higher life, higher purpose meant for loving Krishna, loving his world, his merciful devotees, his most auspicious holy name, his beautiful form and qualities and pastimes. And this simple mood of Vrindavan is most enticing to Lord Krishna's heart. But as we know, Krishna had obligations. He had to fulfill the purpose of his descent, right? He he had to leave Vrindavan because the earth was overburdened by the unnecessary defense forces of different kings, as Srila Prabhupada says in the beginning of the Krishna book. In Bhagavad Gita, chapter 4, verse 8, Lord Krishna says, Avitranaya sadhunam vinastaya chadushkritam dharma samsta panartaya sambhavami yuge yuge. He says, to deliver the pious and to annihilate the miscreants, as well as to reestablish the principles of religion, I myself appear millennium after millennium. So Krishna had to leave his beloved residence of Vrindavan. He had to go to Mathura and then Dwarka. But in Dwarka, sometimes his, his wives would hear him uh, cry at night. He would be crying for his beloved Sri Radha, crying for Vrindavan. In Dwarka, Krishna is surrounded by jeweled palaces and queens and elephants, horses, chariots, soldiers and servants at his every beck and call. There's such a mood of opulence and power and majesty. But at the time of the solar eclipse, Krishna and his family, the great Yadu dynasty, came to Kurukshetra. So Jagannath Puri represents Kurukshetra. And at that time, Nanda Maharaj also came to Kurukshetra, along with Mother Yashoda, and along with Sri Radha and her gopi friends. And they all came there to meet Krishna after a long, long time to see Krishna once again. I wanted to read from you for you a little bit from Srimad Bhagavatam, 82nd chapter, a few of these verses. When Nanda Maharaj learned that the Yadus had arrived, led by Krishna, he immediately went to see them. The cowherds accompanied him, their various possessions loaded on their wagons. Seeing Nanda, the Vrishnis were delighted and stood up like dead bodies coming back to life. Having felt much distress at not seeing him for so long, they held him in a tight embrace. Vasudev embraced Nanda Maharaj with great joy. Beside himself with ecstatic love, Vasudev remembered the troubles Kansa had caused him, forcing him to leave his sons in Gokula for their safety. Krishna and Balaram embraced their foster parents and bowed down to them. But their throats were so choked up with tears of love that the two lords could say nothing. Raising their two sons onto their laps and holding them in their arms, Nanda and saintly Mother Yasoda forgot their sorrow. Then Rohini and Devaki both embraced the queen of Raja remembering the faithful friendship she had shown them, their throats choking with tears, 
they addressed her as follows. Rohini and Devaki said, What woman could forget the unceasing friendship you and Nanda have shown us, dear Queen of Raja? There is no way to repay you in this world, even with the wealth of Indra. They were never afraid, good lady, because you protected them, just as eyelids protect the eyes. Indeed, saintly persons like you never discriminate between outsiders and their own kin. So then in the purport, our great Acharya Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur describes what Devaki was thinking before she spoke this verse. He has such an intimate understanding of the mind of Devaki, right? So he says, alas, because for so long these two sons of mine had you, Yashoda, as their guardian and mother, and because they were immersed in such a vast ocean of ecstatic loving dealings with you, now that you are once more before them, they are too distracted to even notice me. Also, you are behaving as if insane and blind with love for them, showing millions of times more maternal affection than I possess. Thus, you simply keep staring at us, your friends, without even recognizing us. So let me bring you back to reality on the pretext of some affectionate words. Then, when Devaki failed to get any response from Yashoda, even after addressing her, Rohini said, My dear Devaki, it's impossible just now to rouse her out of this ecstatic trance. We are crying in the wilderness, and her two sons are no less bound up in the ropes of affection for her than she is for them. So now let us go outside to meet Prita, Draupadi, and the others. So then the gopis, Krishna goes to meet the gopis there at Kurukshetra, and he began speaking philosophical knowledge of jnana yoga to them, just as his devotee had done when Krishna sent him to Vrindavan to appease the gopis and the other residents there. That out of Vrindavan, Krishna is not the same. Out of Vrindavan, his mood is different. He's not playing his flute. Where are the beloved cows and cow friends and the other Rajabasis? He's a big, powerful king now. And has he forgotten a simple people of Raja? So then the gopis say, The gopis say, O oh, son, who directly destroys the darkness of ignorance, we are scorched by the sun rays of this philosophical knowledge. We are Chakora birds who can subsist only on the moonlight radiating from your beautiful face. Please come back to Vrindavan with us and in this way bring us back to life. And if he says, Please come to Dwarka. There we will enjoy together. They reply that Sri Vrindavan is our home and they are too attached to it for them to take up residence anywhere else. Only there, the gopis imply, can Krishna attract them by wearing peacock feathers in his turban and playing enchanting music on his flute. Only by his appearing again in Vrindavan can the gopis be saved not by any other kind of meditation on him or theoretical knowledge of the self. So this is the mood of Vrindavan. This is the mood of the gopis. And when Lord Chaitanya danced at Rathayatra, he revealed the internal mood of the festival in the mood of Radha wishing to carry Krishna back to Vrindavan. I want to read a little bit from Chaitanya Charitamrita, Madhya Lila also, um, Madhya Lila chapter 13. After abandoning, abandoning the dancing in front of the Ratha Yatra cart, Lord Chaitanya ordered Swarup Damodar to sing. Understanding his mind, Swarup Damodar began to sing as follows. 
Now I have gained the Lord of my life, in the absence of whom I was being burned by Cupid and was withering away. This song refers to Srimati Radharani's meeting with Krishna at the holy place of Kurukshetra, where Lord Sri Krishna and his brother and sister came to visit when there was a solar eclipse. It is a song of separation from Krishna. When Radharani met Krishna at Kurukshetra, she remembered his intimate association in Vrindavan, and she thought, Now I have gained the Lord of my life. In his absence, I was being burned by the arrow of Cupid, and thus I was withering away. Now I have gained my life again. So then continuing a few verses later. This is the purport to verse 119. After giving up the company of the gopis in Vrindavan, Sri Krishna, the son of Maharaj Nanda, engaged in his pastimes at Dwarka. When Krishna went to Kurukshetra with his brother and sister and others from Dwarka, he again met the inhabitants of Vrindavan. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Radha Bhava Duti Suvalita. That is Krishna himself assuming the part of Srimati Radharani in order to understand Krishna. Lord Jagannath Dev is Krishna, and Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Srimati Radharani. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is leading Lord Jagannath toward Gundicha Temple, corresponded with Srimati Radharani leading Krishna toward Vrindavan. Sri Chetra Jagannath Puri was taken as the kingdom of Dwarka, the place where Krishna enjoys supreme opulence. However, he was being led by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to Vrindavan, the simple village where all the inhabitants are filled with ecstatic love for Krishna. Sri Chetra is a place of Aishwarya Lila, just as Vrindavan is a place of Madhurya Lila. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is following at the rear of the Rath, indicated that Lord Jagannath Krishna was forgetting the inhabitants of Vrindavan. Although Krishna neglected the inhabitants of Vrindavan, he could not forget them. Thus, in his opulent Ratha Yatra, he was returning to Vrindavan. In the role of Srimati Radharani, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was examining whether the Lord still remembered the inhabitants of Vrindavan. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu fell behind the Rath car, Jagannath Dev, Krishna himself, understood the mind of Srimati Radharani. Therefore, Lord Jagannath sometimes fell behind the dancing of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to indicate to Srimati Radharani that he had not forgotten. Thus, Lord Jagannath would wait on the Rath for their forward march. In this way, Lord Jagannath agreed that without the ecstasy of Srimati Radharani, he could not feel satisfied. While Jagannath was thus waiting, Gorishinder, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in his ecstasy of Srimati Radharani, immediately came forward to Krishna. At such times, Lord Jagannath would proceed ahead very slowly. These competitive exchanges were all part of the love affair between Krishna and Srimati Radharani. In that competition between Lord Chaitanya's ecstasy for Jagannath and Jagannath's ecstasy for Srimati Radharani, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu emerged successful. But just a few more verses. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu spoke thus to Lord Jagannath, You are the same Krishna, and I am the same Radharani. We are meeting again in the same way that we met in the beginning of our lives. Although we are both the same, my mind is still attracted to Vrindavan Dham. I wish that you will please again appear with your lotus feet in Vrindavan. Kurukshetra, or Jagannath Puri, is crowded with people, their elephants and horses, and the rattling of chariots. In Vrindavan, however, there are flower gardens, and the humming of the beads, bees and chirping of the birds can be heard. Here at Kurukshetra, you are dressed like a royal prince 
accompanied by great warriors. But in Vrindavan, you appear just like an ordinary cowherd boy, accompanied only by your beautiful flute. Here there is not even a drop of the ocean of transcendental happiness that I enjoyed with you in Vrindavan. I therefore request you to come to Vrindavan and enjoy pastimes with me. If you do so, my ambition will be fulfilled. These are the words of Srimati Radharani. Lord Chaitanya in the mood of Srimati Radharani. So this is the mood of Rathayatra, to pull Krishna back to Vrindavan by the ropes of our love. In Vrindavan, Lord Sri Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the cause of all causes, the absolute truth becomes relative, right? The absolute becomes relative. He becomes everyone's dear relative or friend or brother or son or lover in so many varieties of relationships and loving rasas or tastes. Raso vai saha. He is the personification of rasa, sweet relationship. And this is the mood of Raja Bhakti. In Vrindavan, where everyone is inclined to love Krishna, and Krishna is so inclined to love them. Srila Rupa Goswami explains in, in the fourth verse of his uh, Nectar of Instruction, he says, Dadati prati krinati, guyamakyati prachati. Bumte bojayate chaiva sadvidam viti lakshanam. So he instructs us in six exchanges of, of sweet love. He says, Share Krishna's love with others. Give a gift to someone. Open your heart to receive a gift. Reveal your mind in confidence to a trusted friend who shares your heart's aspirations. Everyone needs a trusted friend or two, right? And it doesn't have to be your guru. It doesn't even have to be a senior devotee, just someone you trust. Open your heart and listen deeply and respect their confidence when they open their heart to you as well. Share prashadam or even a tulsi leaf and open your heart to receive the mercy of prashadam from others. So these are the six moods of loving exchanges instructed to us by Rupa Goswami that will nourish our hearts in this sweet Vrindavan mood. So there's one other story I'd like to share as we come to the end of this presentation. A few years ago, I attended a conference in, the, in Italy. I believe it was at Villa Vrindavan. And there was a scholar who gave a paper. And the paper, the name of the paper he gave was Why the Hare Krishna Movement Will Be Successful. So I was really shocked, especially at that time, because no one ever said anything like that. So what was his thesis? He had studied various religious institutions, various sorts of gurus, some the strictly charismatic types without any real tradition behind them, and some the more didactic types who depended more on a formal institution and or on a body of teachings. And he said that in ISKCON, as long as we have both, the ecstatic kirtan festivals, like this Jagannath Rathayatra that you've all been a part of, and so many other beautiful festivals, even today, so many online festivals of the Holy Name and others, even, even virtually. So he said that as long as we keep our allegiance and fidelity to Srila Prabhupada and following the mood of our previous acharyas that are, who are coming down in disciplic succession, as long as we have the ecstatic kirtan festivals, ecstatic different kinds of festivals, and if keeping our allegiance and fidelity to this line of disciplic succession coming from Srila Prabhupada, as long as we have both, um, as Srila Prabhupada so brilliantly visionary in a visionary way and so kindly gave us, then he said the Hare Krishna movement will be successful. Hare Krishna. So beautiful. So in conclusion, what is the mood of Ratha Yatra that we'd like to carry beyond the festival? First of all, I'd say that Ratha Yatra is a joyful festival where the Lord comes out of his temple and gives the blessings of his darshan to everyone. He is Petita Pavana, merciful to the most fallen people, that's us. 
and we can carry his mood of mercy forward and extend it in all humility to whomever we meet. This will please him because he is Jagannath, the Lord of the universe, because every living being is his beloved part and parcel, although many of us have forgotten that. And second, we can journey beyond the festival, pulling Lord Jagannath by the ropes of our love, by becoming simple, sincere, and without pretension or hypocrisy, following his dearmost residence of Vrindavan. And three, to journey beyond the festival would mean to me to aspire to unselfishly give and receive Krishna's love as taught by Srila Rupa Goswami and exemplified by Srila Prabhupada and Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So this is life's ultimate goal, prema pumartha mahan, beyond personal goals of enjoyment or knowledge or even liberation. And if our, in our lives we can endeavor to make our hearts like this, simple and sweet, like Vrindavan, then we can journey beyond this festival. And this will be our soul journey back to the lotus feet and to the heart of Lord Krishna. Because Krishna leaves his heart in Vrindavan and he never takes a step out of that holy dawn. So thank you all so very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Wow, thank you so much for that beautiful and deep class. Very fitting for the last class of the festival. Um, I have so many reflections, but we have quite a few questions coming in. So if it's okay, we'll dive right in so that we can all take advantage of your association while we have it. Um, and just want to remind everybody watching at home, please do submit your questions. You can do so in the comments on YouTube or Facebook, as well as the anonymous form. Um, the link is posted there as well for you. So we'll dive right in. Um, so Rikmini Prabhu, again, there's quite a few questions. First one is, um, we always hear that Krishna is more pleased by the mood of Vrindavan than Dwarka. But do we in the material world always have to be in the mood of awe and reverence? Well, the mood of awe and reverence, thank you for this very deep question. The mood of awe and reverence is where we begin our journey. Excuse me. Krishna gives, um, Sukadev Goswami has nine cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam before beginning to describe the pastimes of Krishna in Vrindavan. The first 40 chapters of the 10th canto are Krishna in Vrindavan. But first we have to understand nine cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam to understand the supremacy of Krishna. So we have to gradually begin by praying to his lotus feet, meditating on his lotus feet and gradually looking up from his feet to his calves, to his thighs, to his waist, and gradually, gradually coming up to that intimacy of Vrindavan. Otherwise, there is there is a tendency to take things cheaply and to misunderstand. And Srila Prabhupada was always so careful to warn us um, to understand Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead and begin all our deity worship and all the Iskand temples is in this mood of Lakshmi Narayan or on reverence. But embedded within that mood is the sweetness of Vrindavan. So I hope that's a little bit helpful. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is, you mentioned that we shouldn't have false motives in Krishna consciousness, but that is a little confronting since I'm not a pure devotee. How can I purify my desires? Yeah, that takes a lot of intention and it takes a lot of prayer. Because usually in our, in our ordinary lives, when we see dirt come up from the heart, when we see some bad qualities come up to the surface, we like to just push it under the rug. We like to bury it. We don't want to see it, and we certainly don't want anyone else to see it. But this is, this is the gradual movement, the gradual pulling, um, pulling ourselves to the mood of the residence of Vrindavan. So, our, our public persona and our private persona should be the same. We shouldn't have, and I think sometimes devotees, we all suffer very much when we have a, a public persona that we show to the world and show to the other devotees that I'm, I'm such a pure devotee. But it's actually, there's so much more integrity to open our hearts and ask for help from our God brothers and God sisters, from someone who we trust. As I mentioned earlier, you don't 
throw, throw all your anarchas before everyone, but you want to reveal them to a trusted friend and, and ask for help and pray to Krishna and ask, ask to see those anarchas. And if that's our desire, Krishna will help us to see them because the goal is to amalgamate that public persona and the private persona to be one, to be simple. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you. It actually um, relates to another question that came in. Uh, this person says, can you please elaborate on how to treat everyone equally while also being discerning about our association? Isn't the act of discerning somewhat offensive? Yeah. Every Krishna is in the heart of every living being, but we don't go off into the jungle and stick our head into the mouth of a tiger. So we have to use our discernment, but still keeping that internal vision that this is a beloved part and parcel of Krishna, being careful to act appropriately. So yes, discernment is like the warrior's sword. So we, we embark on the journey of the soul and the, the service is its own reward and discernment is the warrior's sword and sacred love is the only goal. So yes, discernment. It's a great word. I love the word discernment. We don't use it so much in Krishna consciousness, but Christians use it a lot. Discernment is a very, very fine thing. But the internal vision is that everyone is a beloved part and parcel of Krishna. But again, don't stick your head into the line. Thank you. <clears throat> it's interesting because <clears throat> it comes up a lot in terms of you know, we talk so much about giving association to those who are junior, being peers with our peers and, and seeking association from those who are senior. And sometimes a lot of people feel even that discernment, how can I say that I'm, I can offer somebody my association can be confusing for people. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yes, we can offer appreciation. And everyone needs appreciation from the biggest, biggest gurus to the person who first walked into the temple. Every single person needs appreciation because we thrive on appreciation. Not only do we thrive on appreciation, we thrive by giving appreciation. And by giving appreciation and receiving appreciation, these are the six exchanges that he, Rupa Goswami talks about. By, by those exchanges of love, this melts the pride in the heart. But sometimes we want to be so boundary that, oh, who am I? How can I say anything? How can I do anything? And, and I have to only talk to my guru or I only have to talk to some big senior devotee. No, why not reach out and help someone who's right next to you? That's so authentic. And um, this will melt the stone heart. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, I, I know that Lord Jagannath is very merciful. So why does he prevent so many people from entering his temple in Puri? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, you know, we could go and storm the gates of the Jagannath temple at Puri, but I guess following in the mood of Lord Chaitanya, we don't do that. We respect the tradition and respect the culture. And I mean, look at the great Haridas Thakur, another great Muslim devotee of the Lord. He worshiped the chakra on the outside of the temple and he was so humble and meek. And of course, Lord Chaitanya would every day bring him Jagannath Mahaprasad, Rupa and Sanatan themselves didn't enter the Jagannath temple because they had been ostracized from Hindu society. So yeah, it doesn't really make sense to us why why that's there. Prabhupada certainly boldly went there and said, hey, let these Western people in, they're Vaishnavas. But tradition is tradition and sometimes tradition becomes a barricade on the heart. But I think there's a way to respond to that with, with humility and, and gracious love and, and show them the authentic qualities of of what a Vaishnav is, and then maybe one day they'll recognize that the Vaishnav can't be you know, discriminated against coming from any culture, any color, any class, any class. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is, what is the best way to prepare ourselves for a pilgrimage to the Holy Dham? Mm, beautiful. Were there traditional things like you know, fasting when you get there and so many things that are given in Shastra. But if you read the Chaitanya Charitamrita, 
Lord Chaitanya and um, his devotees, when they went, when they got to Jagannath Puri, uh, was it, I believe it was Gopinath Acharya was speaking, was standing on the roof of, of the king's palace with uh, King Prachaparudra. And he was observing the uh, devotees of Lord Chaitanya and he said, look, they're not observing the, the rules of, of a pilgrimage. They just all ran to see Lord Chaitanya. So sometimes um, these rules are helpful and they can help us go into a deep place of meditation. But sometimes when the love is overwhelming, those rules can be put aside also. But um, mostly the rules are there as a framework. The ritual and rules are the kind of the box. Like if you get a birthday present, it comes in a box with a ribbon, with paper. So ritual is like that box, is like the, the paper in the box. And inside the box of the ritual, there's supposed to be that ecstatic love. So yeah, the rituals can be helpful. You can look at them. Sometimes some people like to go very deeply into those things and some people don't. So it depends on the individual. Thank you. That's a very sweet answer. I certainly have had experiences where I've arrived in the Dham and I don't, I feel like I'm physically there, but I haven't arrived for a while. It takes some time. So thank you for that. Um, the next question is, can you tell us one of your favorite personal experiences of a Ratiatra? And particularly, um, did you ever attend a Ratiatra with Srila Prabhupada present? Oh, yes. Um, 1976 Ratiatra in New York, Srila Prabhupada, it was, he was like the great conquering hero. I mean, he writes in his Chaitanya Charitamrita purports about how uh, the London Ratha Yatra, Jagannath Rathkart was rivaling Nelson's column. But he was, I just imagine, I mean, who can even imagine Srila Prabhupada coming to New York in 1960, um, 65, really as a penniless person. He was starving when he was in New York. He was penniless. And uh, all he had was his Srimad Bhagavatams to, to give to people to try to make a few dollars here and there. And then in 1976, um, so what was that 11 years later, that he would be riding down Fifth Avenue in Jagannath, on Subhadra's cart um, with his beloved Lord Jagannath. You can imagine what he must have been feeling. So this is so beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's, a, there's a member of the organizing committee who's asking on a similar vein, um, she's asking, what do you think are, if we were to, if Prabhupada were here today and we were to ask him, Prabhupada, what are the three things we can do at this festival that would please you the most? What do you think you would say? Well, I think I think that's what I, I said at the end of what I was speaking, that, you know, be simple and sincere without ulterior motive. Um, carry this mood of petita pavana, don't discriminate. Um, carry this mood of, of mercy and magnanimity of Lord Chaitanya and Lord Jagannath. Carry that mood forward to everyone you meet. And then take it seriously in, in our own lives, you know. Um, make Krishna, make Lord Jagannath the hero of the story of your life. You know, be, we can be a minor supporting character, but we don't have to have a little self-centered life where I'm the star. Make Krishna the star, make Krishna your hero and, and worship him with, in your heart of hearts. I think this is what Prabhupada was trying to impress upon us. Um, make him your own. Krishna is yours. He's mine. He's everyone. That's all. <laughs> that's the reality. So I think that's the mood to carry forward that, to pull him, to pull Dragon up into our place. Thank you so much. Um, on a related note, sometimes in the in, with the desire to sort of attract newcomers or people who've never been to the festival before to our festival, we do have things like cooking demonstrations or little meditation things and yoga and and, um, and so on. How do you think Srila Prabhupada would feel about that? Because we've certainly come across some people who um, say that that may not be the right way to go about things. What would you say to that? Well, you know, Srila Prabhupada was much more broad-minded and 
not a stereotype personality. I think, I think these days people think that Srila Prabhupada was some kind of a stereotype in the box thinker, but he was always up for the latest and most, most outrageous thing to do for Krishna to try. And sometimes it would fail and then he would try something else. He would always do what was unexpected and he was always up for a new idea for extending the mercy of Lord Krishna, extending the, the sweetness of Krishna consciousness. So I think it's very regrettable that people try to make Srila Prabhupada into some kind of an ultra-Orthodox character, which he was not. He was very, very broad-minded and um, very welcoming to all new ideas of how to spread Krishna consciousness. So I think the cooking demonstrations, the yoga, I think it's all fantastic. And I think the success of your festival has shown that. So thank you so much for that. Thank you for your encouragement. It's, um, I'm currently reading Chasing Rhinos, the second one. And you're right, it's just filled with adventures and shenanigans and Prabhupada was cool with all of it. So it's, yeah. it's nice to see that, yeah. Shamasundar says um, that, that Srila Prabhupada would always say or do the most unexpected thing. <laughs> If anyone thought that they knew what Srila Prabhupada was going to do or going to say, I'll give you an example. Once I asked Srila Prabhupada a question, I said, he kept talking about sincerity. And, and I said, but Srila Prabhupada, how can we become sincere? And he just looked at me really intently and he said, how do you become a thief? <laughs> I mean, can you imagine the most <laughs> unexpected answer? I was so shocked. And I said, well, I guess you would practice stealing and you would associate with thieves and you would learn to talk the way they talk and eat what they eat and he was laughing he said yes so you must practice <laughs> and then one, one, once Burjan Prabhu tells a story once in Australia he was asked the same question and he answered by saying how do you become a drunkard <laughs> <laughs> so the same answer you would associate with drunkards and find out where they get the best wine and and then he turned to his disciples. He was on a stage at that time. He turned to his disciples and he said, you associate with them because they are sincere. So, <laughs> so sweet. Um, I just read the story last night when um, Shama Sundar Prabhu was taking Srila Prabhupada and I think Jekataka Swami was in the car and maybe two other devotees. Um, they were driving to see um, the younger brother of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, which to me was just kind of mind-blowing that the son of Srila Bhakti Vinod, like your generation was able to meet him. Like that was kind of mind-blowing. I met him. I actually saw him. He looked just like Bhakti Vinod Thakur. Wow. Amazing. It just kind of blew my mind last night. I was just thinking like, wait, my parents are old enough to know Srila Bhakti Vinod's son. It, doesn't, it was just kind of like a wow moment for me. And um, Shama Sundar Prabhu was telling the story of how on the way, somehow there was like a three foot gap in the road. Do you know this story? No. Um, so there was like a three foot gap in the road and then a little bit ahead, another three foot gap. And so Shama Sundar Prabhu stopped the car and he said, okay, Srila Prabhupada, should we walk from here? And Prabhupada turned around. He told everybody in the back seat to get out of the car. <laughs> and then he told Shama Sundar Prabhu to back up and just gun it over both of the gaps. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, Shamasana Prabhu's style of writing, he's like, wow, our very own Stephen McQueen moment. And <laughs> I had to Google who that was, but um, so he did it. And so, you know, just another example of Prabhupada's just being filled with unexpected things and just incredible sense of adventure. So thank you for that answer. <laughs> um, another question is, I think you've kind of addressed this, but maybe if you don't mind, we can ask it. And um, Maybe you can elaborate. Somebody says, sometimes after these types of festivals, we're on a high, but then Jagannath feels far away after some time. You mentioned that we can be compassionate to others, but how can we be more compassionate to ourselves in a spiritual way? That's beautiful. Compassion to oneself, being, being gentle to oneself, and, um, and not beating ourselves up for the mistakes we make. Someone, my, my friend Ananda Vrindavan, she's our community president here in Washington, D.C. She was telling me a story the other day of, of a friend whose father used to ask the family every night at the dinner table, how did you fail today? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really brilliant 
to ask ourselves, how did you fail today? Because failure, um, our, our future advancement and our future successes are built on our complete failures. So failure, what did Prabhupada say? Failure is the color of success. So up is failure, right? But if, if we're really sincerely trying, then those failures, if you read Prabhupada Lilamrita, my husband's been, Anuttama Prabhu's been reading Prabhupada Lilamrita for maybe the 20th, 15th, 20th time. And it's amazing. He reads out loud um, parts of it. And if you read the first volume, Lifetime in Preparation, if you if that was the only volume and you didn't know that there were more volumes, you'd think this is a story of failure after failure after failure. This is a story of someone who was a complete failure in life. And even in New York, so many failures, so many heartbreaking failures, one after another after another. But this is what um, tempers the gold, tem tem tempers the metal to become more successful. And then, of course, the mentality of a, of a devotee is, I'm doing this as an offering. My service is my offering. And Krishna can make me a successful failure. It's up to him, but I'm just doing this as my offering. And, and then I think also, I definitely wanted to speak a little bit about community building. If I can, can I take a couple minutes to? Yes, please. I really wanted to share this beautiful quote from Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj, who was such a great community builder. And I think it speaks to all of us as we try to build our communities. And I think it's a, a good thing to hear and to think about at the time of Arathiyatra. So he says, this is from his um, Reflections on Sacred Teachings, Volume 3, Harinam Chintamani. So he says, we do not just want to become members of a powerful institution, but we want to experience the theology in such a way that our lives preach our message. We want people to feel amazed by our culture of devotion. If the participants are wholesome, the families are strong, and their physical and psychological needs are met, this devotional culture will certainly amaze people. Most important, they should see how the spiritual care offered to those in the immediate environment extends outwards. We're talking about going out, right? Going out beyond, journeying beyond the festival. And I know you're involved in spiritual care. So this spiritual care should extend outward beyond the immediate environment, right? We must first influence our own communities in order to influence the society. If we cannot first, if we cannot first influence our own communities in order to influence the society, if we cannot first help ourselves, how will we execute the commission of these great acharyas who want us to assist them in global transformation? A very beautiful meditation about uh, healing our own communities and the spiritual care needed in our communities in order to impact the world. Our, our, our own lives have to preach, right? We're, we talk so much about preach, preach, preach. Srila Prabhupada said once, we are hearing so much about preach, 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 but they do not know. They must be empowered to preach. So this is Krishna, Krishna's gift. If our own lives can and live the message. There's a beautiful line from St. Francis where he says, I try to preach all day long, and if necessary, I also use a few words. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think Krishna wanted us to hear that because um, Mother Urmila just said that she quoted the exact same quote just yesterday in her talk. So. Um, I always feel Krishna tells us things that he wants us to know more than once. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, can you talk a little more? There's just, just a few more questions, if that's okay. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what that that quote from Maharaj is so sweet, and it's related to this kind of elaboration of the same question. What does self-care look like 
realistically. So for example, you're speaking about, you know, being able to enrich the communities that we can go outwards and preach if we're empowered. But what does it look like? Because sometimes it might be, it might appear to be on the bodily platform, like going to get your hair done or going to get a massage or, or those kinds of things. So can you give us some practical advice on what self-care should entail? Well, you know, Atma does mean um, the whole self. It means the body, the mind, the emotions, the spirit. So we are living within these bodies and we have to care for the, the coat, right? If you have a nice coat, you have to take it to the cleaners. You have to make sure it's done properly. In the winter, maybe you put it in mothballs or something. I mean, in the summer, you put it in mothballs. So you have to take care of the, the coat and the shirt and the underneath the lingerie. I mean, you know, I think devotees tend to be, in this time, we tend to be very black and white in our thinking rather than more nuanced in our thinking. But even Srila Prabhupada had a son who was, had, had mental disturbances and Srila Prabhupada took him to a psychiatrist. And eventually that son, he was a bit mad or quite mad and he ran away. And even Srila Prabhupada wasn't able to help that son. So, um, yeah, we have to use the resources that are there. And I think those resources are sent by Krishna. If you hear something or learn something that can help you physically or mentally or emotionally. I mean, right now I'm quite inspired by the work of the pastoral care initiative that Ramburu has started. And if any of you are interested in connecting, can share her contact information but she's training pastoral counselors which is a tremendous urgent need in all our communities because so many devotees do have emotional difficulties or mental challenges or family problems marriage problems different problems so i think every one of our community i know you radabakti you're involved in this um spiritual care initiative in, in a leadership way but i think Every one of our communities should have pastoral counselors that can help um, in, in all of these ways. So I think it's very, very important. So not, not that we only focus on the soul, we also have to take care of the mind, the body, the emotions, nourishing the whole lot. Thank you for saying that because there is a stigma in the world, and ISKCON is not an exception of going to get mental health counseling from somebody on the, you know, the quote unquote outside. Um, so thank you for saying that, because I would agree that it's necessary and how wonderful if we can have resources within the devotee community who are also trained um, professionally. That would be yeah. amazing. Actually, I wanted to say once I went to a conference at the United Nations in New York and there were women, it was a women's, uh, the speakers were women and they were talking about domestic abuse and there were Christians, Jews, Muslims, and um, yeah, Christians, Jews, Muslims, and Buddhists. And there were no Hindus speaking. And they were talking about uh, domestic abuse. And each one of them, when they spoke, they said, yeah, in our community, people say that, oh, this happens to other people. It doesn't happen in our community. And um, and sometimes these this domestic abuse is, is rampant in in all communities and it's not spoken of, it's hidden, it's an embarrassment. So if we know about these kinds of problems, we have to try to help with discretion, try to see what we can do to help to get counseling to people and to um, be resources or to help people find resources because this is so counterproductive when devotees are just pushing these analysis under the rug and masquerading with a, a false persona. Um, you know, externally and hiding this, um, the false persona inside. Yeah, thank you. And it leads me to another question that it's nice that this is coming up in a conversation about journeying beyond the festival because while we are in this festival spirit, everything seems really genuinely amazing. Even this year, while everything has been virtual, there's been like legitimate Krishna magic the last 12 days. I can't even tell you just so many pastimes that have been so wonderful that we experience every year and this year in a more special way. And then we joke sometimes as a committee that like, 
after the festival, like, don't talk to me for a week. Like, I, I need some space from you sometimes. Um, but, you know, we love each other. But sometimes just in, in the practical day to day, once this kind of festivities, these kind of festivities are over, we do have interpersonal conflicts with devotees. We do feel betrayed by devotees sometimes. And, you know, even after somebody has, you know, matured in their Krishna consciousness, that's still very difficult to um, rationalize. And so you were speaking a little bit about, you know, us thinking that these things couldn't happen in our own community. I think I think very much I used to feel that way as well, that like, you know, we, we can't, you know, hurt each other within this gun, but it happens. So can you give some counsel, first of all, how to how to think about that situation when we are the recipient and also to sometimes we're the ones who un unintentionally hurt people. Um, so can you speak a little bit about how we can cope in those situations? Yeah, there's there's tremendous power in, in a sincere apology. Even if it's something very small, even if you're not really even sure if you offended the other person, to go and to say, you know, I was so wrong in what I said or, or how I said it, or I was so neglectful that you've been cooking the Rajbog offering at the Toronto Temple for the last six years, and I've never even stopped to thank you. You know, or you've been giving a cooking demonstration at the Toronto Ratha Yatra for the last 48 years, and now your kids are doing it. And I never stopped to appreciate and I just wanted to, to let you know how grateful I am and how grateful the community is, or to apologize for some um, something. Do I have time to tell a story? Yeah, we have plenty of time. Okay, this is a really good story that I'm gonna share with you. It's not from our devotional community, but it's very helpful. So the story is about a music teacher and he was taking his high school music class to New York from some other city to hear a very famous conductor um, conduct uh, an orchestra there. And with great trouble and expense, he organized this class trip to New York. So when they got there, three of the girls in the class decided that, wow, I'm in New York. And they skipped the concert and they went shopping. <laughs> and he was so furious. And he was, the next morning he was saying to his wife, those brats, those ungrateful brats, I went to so much trouble and so much expense because this was so important for their musical education. And they're so ungrateful. They just skipped the, the whole thing and they went, they went off shopping somewhere. And so his wife was very wise and she said, I think you, you owe them an apology. And he said, what? me or them they, they're the ones who should be apologizing to me and she said well think about it i think you owe them an apology so then what happened was this is after the trip right he, the next day he called them into his office and they were looking at each other and thinking uh-oh we are really in trouble and we're really going to get it and what's going to happen are we going to get are we going to flunk the class? Are we going to get expelled? What's going to happen to us? They knew that they were the ones who had done something wrong. But he changed them up. And he said to them very sincerely, not in an artificial way, but very sincerely, he said to them, I really have to apologize to you. And they were shocked. You're going to apologize to us? He said, I have to apologize to you because I really failed you in your education. I failed to impress upon you how important this concert was for your music, musical education. So please forgive me because I've actually failed you here. And their hearts were so melted by his apology. So we can try that also in our own lives. We can try that with our kids even. We can apologize to kids for a good amount. We can apologize to your wife, to your husband. You can apologize to your temple commander, temple president. You can apologize to anyone. There's tremendous power because this is the power of humility. When we can say, you know, I really failed you. I've known you for so many years, but I've never really stopped to ask you 
told him soon. I know, I know your husband lost his job last month. And is there anything I can do? Would you like to come and stay at our house? Can I bring dinner over for your family? Is there, is there any help I can, you know, there's so many, many ways that um, you can reach out and can touch people's hearts. And I think there's, uh, you know, maybe you know the story of when Sheila Bhakti Siddhanta had, uh, there was a story of one at, at the Gaudi Amat, there was a big festival and everyone was preparing for the festival. And what happened was one of the disciples of Bhakti Siddhanta had had some unfortunate fall down and he, out of great embarrassment, he left the mosque. And and they were all so busy that preparing for the festival that they, this is a good festival story actually, when their Guru Maharaj Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur came there and saw the decorations and the beautiful festival, he said, oh, where is so-and-so Brahmachari? And they were all so embarrassed. They said, oh, um, what he left. And so Shirobhakti Siddhanta just ignored the decorations. He ignored the festival. He said, well, go find him. But no one knew where to find him. But someone knew that he had he used to work in a, in a shop fixing watches. So they went and checked all the shops that were fixing watches. And finally, they found, found him. And he was so embarrassed. He had some fall down with a, a lady or something. He was too embarrassed to come back. But he was so happy and so grateful when they found him and brought him back. And he actually became one of the initiating gurus in the Gaudiya So this is an amazing story. So just see how, how heart-changing that appreciation is to the, the smallest. As I quoted that thing from Jesus Christ, as you do unto the least of these, you do unto me. And Lord Chaitanya said the same thing in Chaitanya Bhagavad. I made it, I softened it up a little bit because what he said was actually too heavy to be repeated. So Lord Chaitanya said, um, you know, every one of these living beings are my beloved types and types. So sometimes we get an intuition from Sufi soul. We talk to this person. This person needs to hear from you. Spend a, spend a moment and talk to them. Or well, I think a lot of times in our temples, We'll all be talking to our friends and there's some new person who's never been there before. No one talks to them. And then sometimes we hear a story, oh, I came here once six years ago, but nobody talked to me. So I didn't come back and now I'm back six years later. So we should really, really listen to that little, still small voice in our hearts that Krishna is telling us to reach out and help. And, and in this way, by helping others, we help ourselves. So the question, some of the questions were about self-care and self-help. This is the best way to help yourself, to reach out to help someone else, because you will be so uplifted by helping that other person as well. Or by doing a humble service. If you're bewildered in your mind, how am I going to deal with this problem? Pick up a broom and sweep the temple. Go wash some pots. And all of a sudden, the answers become very clear. Okay? Thank you so much. We just want to keep you in our pocket, Rukmini Prabhu. You need to come and stay in Toronto. And I'm, you know, I selfishly get to have you in New York sometimes as well, but that's beautiful. And it's funny because there's two last questions and somehow you unknowingly segued very beautifully um, when you were speaking about cleaning things up. Because one of the questions is, if you don't mind, can you speak a little bit on the significance of Gundicha cleanup? Yeah, isn't that interesting that before the Ratha Yatra festival, Lord Chaitanya had to make the, the heart, right? The, excuse me, the Gundicha Mandir represents the heart, represents Vrindavan, right? They had to make Vrindavan as uh, Gundicha as cl clean as a, as a pure heart of a devotee. So, yeah, it's so, so important. And... You know, in the early days, we were just reading in the Lilamrita of Srila Prabhupada had the first initiation. The devotees didn't know how to do the achman. They didn't know that they shouldn't eat the bananas from the yagya. They didn't know anything. And 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 then they, after they were all initiated and then they all left. And Srila Prabhupada had to clean up the whole room himself. So this is really a, a symptom of our neophyte thinking if we... If we don't know that before and after the festival, there's so much cleaning up to do, so much cleaning up. And 
And it should really be a continuous process, right? Not stuffing the dirt back down in our hearts, but but praying to Krishna. There's a poem by Robert Burns, a Scottish poet, where he says something like, give me the gift to see myself as others see me. So other people can often see our faults that we don't see ourselves. So I think that's a matter of praying to Krishna. In that Gundicha Mandir uh, Leela, Lord Chaitanya was, was collecting bigger piles of dirt than anyone else. And so that's so amazing. So I always had this question, who is it that really cleans the heart? Is it Krishna who cleans our heart or is it is that our job? But really it's kind of like a, a collaborative effort. It's a partnership that we ask Krishna to let us see. And then Krishna can actually be, can be the, he can become the garbage man and go into our hearts and clean our hearts. But we have to want it. If we want to keep putting the garbage back, then Krishna will, you know, do as you wish to do, as he says at the end of Bhagavad Gita, because Love can never be forced. Bhakti can never be forced. So whatever we want, if we want to come closer to him, if we want to journey further on this journey beyond the festival, we have to let Krishna know um, and let him into our defenses and take down the barricades. Let him know that we want to journey further, closer to Vrindavan, and we want to clean up the scene of the world. Wow, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> we just have a few minutes left. Um, so I just want to thank you on behalf of the Toronto Red Theatre Committee and the whole Toronto congregation. We really hope and pray we get to serve you in person one day at our festival. And we know that you're in high demand. So thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. It was so deep and shastric and we're just hungry for much more. So thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. I love the devotees from Toronto and I love the Toronto Temple, although I've only been there once in my life. But thank you. It's been such a great honor to, to serve Jagannath and, and to serve all of you. Thank, thank you. you. And we'll fix that. You'll come more than once. <laughs> um, and for everybody watching at home, thank you again so much for, for being here for these last 12 days. It's not over just yet. We have a couple more things planned for you today. We've got our Grand finale, Kirtan, coming up right at 6.30 with Amala Kirtan Prabhu from 6.30 to 7. Yeah, and then we have another Arts and Culture Showcase from uh, that starts at 7 p.m. directed by His Holiness Bhakti Mark Swami. Uh, we want to thank you all again so much for being here. Um, there is a link in the Facebook and YouTube um, comments where if you could click on that, we would love to send you some books. We always distribute books at Center Island at the site of our festival, but since we can't do that, we would love to send you some in the mail. So please feel free to fill out that form. Um, now, the other thing we just wanted to quickly announce was um, the day that His Holiness Bhakti Charya Swami had passed away, we were supposed to have a talk that evening that turned into a beautiful panel discussion around uh, remembering His Holiness Bhakti Charya Swami. So we just, and it was beautiful. Um, and we just wanted to let you know that we've rescheduled that very important talk. Um, Her Grace Krishna Nandini Prabhu will be speaking on July 15th. Please mark your calendars from 6.30 p.m. Eastern until 8 on the topic of racism and spirituality. She is, as you all know, one of the most gifted speakers and very beloved at our festival. She's been coming every year for several years. So please make sure to tune in for that. Um, and with that, with with sadness, but also so much hope from this talk that we've just received from Her Grace Rukmini Prabhu. We say thank you so much and Hare Krishna, and we'll see you again very soon. Hare Krishna.